uh, in the UK in 2006. Um, lone parent employment rose from 45 to 57 percent over that period, and it accounts on its own for 25 percent of the fall in child poverty. So we saw quite dramatic stuff going on. But in fact, the red line hasn't ticked up straight away. It's continued to plateau for a while. And that's because after 2008, there were increases put into child tax credit. Uh, in the first couple of years of the coalition, there were inflationary <coughs> increases in benefits. But then after that, that stopped. So we're still waiting for those results to come in, essentially. Um, David Cameron keeps telling everybody that child poverty kept on falling when the coalition came into power. It was between 2009 and 2000. 11, I don't think you can really claim that was due to the coalition's policies. Um, however, what we're now going to see, and we've already seen, is a rise of uh, 500,000 children in poverty already on the absolute or fixed indicator. So that's the indicator that tells you what's happening to real incomes. Uh, so we we're already seeing rises on that, on that measure. So where, where are we in the EU? We're about in the middle. So we went from being kind of at the top, at the top end of the, 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 the countries with the highest child poverty rates, to more or less in the middle. But the next uh, graph shows you something interesting about this. This is, looks really complicated. This is the same graph, essentially, of all the European countries. The red boxes on the top show you what the child poverty rate is before the effects of the social security system. And you'll see that the two highest bars are the UK and Ireland. Uh, we have the, 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 the highest pre-redistribution uh, levels of child poverty. So our social security systems do most of the heavy lifting. It's our social security system that brings that down to the kind of middling level that you saw on the previous chart. So obviously, if you're going to damage that social security system, then you're going to mean, you're going to affect the child poverty rate quite substantially. Um, if we'd carried on with the same kind of measures we'd had pre-2010, we would have followed the green line and, and hit the target to end child poverty, which was to reduce it to 10%. <coughs> The idea was to reach, reach that by 2020. We would have got there by about 22, 23 if we'd carried on the same trajectory. But of course, now we're not on that trajectory anymore. We're going in the opposite direction. And the figures kind of speak for themselves. Between 98, which was the baseline year for the Child Poverty Act, we went where there was 3.4 million children in poverty. That fell by 1.1 million after 10 years to 2.3. But now the estimates are suggesting we're gonna go straight back up almost to where we started uh, as a result of the cuts to benefits and, and tax credits and the northern ireland situation is um uh, is, is is kind of starts from a higher base it starts from about uh, 20 percent rate of poverty and they're expecting it to go up to a 26 percent poverty rate but of course it's delayed here because of the actions taken to actually delay the implementation of a lot of these things so that's an interesting finding. The other thing it's important in this debate to take account of is the change in which children are poor. It's now the case that two thirds of poor children live with working parents. So the majority picture uh, of a poor family is a family where they're going out to work but still don't get enough money to be able to meet their basic needs. And that's a big shift since uh, the early 2000s when you were more likely to be out of work and poor than in work and poor. So we've reduced the number of people who are workless and poor but increased the number of people in low paid work and still uh, in poverty. Um, so we're now not going to meet the 2020 target, let's face it, we all know this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it, because of all the cuts to benefits and tax credits, 21 billion a year going through at the moment, and now another 12 billion announced in the last July budget. Um, and we know that these have significantly hit families with children. About 70% of those cuts hit families with children. 60% of the cuts, right from 2010 onwards, are uh, hitting working families. I think it's, it's, this has come out through the debate around tax credits that we've just had and just narrowly escaped those tax credit cuts. But actually, throughout, the majority of cuts have been on, on low-income working families. Um, this was a chart put together by the House of Commons Library. Um, the orange bar at the top, this is, this is the, the, as the, how the save savings stack up over the years. So you can see them kind of growing as time goes on. The orange bit at the top is a bit that's just due to the change in the uprating of benefits from the RPI to the CPI. That's the biggest area of savings, changing the way benefits are uprated. 
And then if you look at the rest, the next biggest is tax credits. Tax credits have been slashed <coughs> since 2010. Child benefit, housing benefit and council tax benefit. Many of these are benefits, of course, claimed by families in work. So you can see how, uh, how, how, they, how they stack up there. Um, so, I mean, my argument now is we're facing a child poverty crisis. We're basically going back, essentially, to where we started. The latest projections from uh, the Resolution Foundation suggest that the July budget alone will have increased child poverty by between 300 and 600,000. So the projection now by 2020 is that it will have risen by about 1.5 million. So if that's not a child poverty crisis, I don't know what is. <laughs> So what's the response from the government? Let's move the goalposts. Uh, they're going to abolish the Child Poverty Act. The Welfare Reform and Work Bill uh, basically just guts the whole thing and, and, and uh, replaces it with a couple of measures, one on worklessness uh, and one on uh, children's attainment at age 16. Uh, they're working on other life chances measures, but basically the one thing they won't measure is, is family income. Um, although we had a victory on Monday uh, in the House of Lords, the House of Lords voted 290 to 197 to put those measures back in to the bill. Of course, there'll be some yo-yo in between the Commons and, and the Lords after now. Um, but it was great that we've actually got it back in, at least temporarily. Um, so we're going to lose our way of actually um, charting officially what's happening. The figures will still be produced by the government, but they won't be reported on. And in fact, the amendment, all the amendment does is to ask them to carry on reporting on it. It doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> so the next question is, did those with the broadest shoulders bear the greatest burden, as George Osborne said? We're all in it together. <laughs> um, this is the last chart produced by the t Treasury to show what happened to the income distribution. So the column on the left is the, is the poorest 10%. The column on the far right is the richest 10%. And... The last time they produced this was for 2014-15, and you can see very significantly, as the line goes down, it's the people in the poorest half of the income distribution that have taken the biggest hit, although there's a, a relatively large hit to the top 10%. But this chart includes um, measures from January 2010, so it includes a lot of Alistair Darling's package, including some tax rises. So the LSE have done it again, um, doing it from May 2010 and what you see there very clearly they've divided it into 20 this time but same thing poorest half and richest half what you see is the whole of the poorest half of the income distribution is worse off and the whole of the richest half of the income distribution is better off except for the top five percent um, who've got to have taken a little tax hit and the other extraordinary finding from this was that there are no savings all of the savings from the poorest half have gone to fund tax breaks for the richest half. It's just straightforward reverse Robin Hood, <laughs> taking from the poor and giving to the rich. So there are no savings. And this is the uh, chart from the Institute for Fiscal Studies that showed the impact of just the July budget that, that came through. And you can see it's absolutely, uh, you know, totally the bottom half of the income distribution that's affected. Uh, by those changes and huge losses. This included the tax credit changes, uh, but we'll come on later t to look at universal credit where I think it's true to say the same cuts will come through. So what's happened actually is a stay of execution. We haven't got the cuts to tax credits now, but we'll get them through in universal credit anyway, <coughs> but it'll just happen later. Uh, so, I mean, the consequences of all of this for child poverty are devastating. We already know that Child poverty means that uh, children tend to fall behind in education, they have much worse health, likely to die younger, more likely to be killed on the roads, uh, have poor self-esteem, and it costs us a fortune. Um, Donald Hirsch from uh, Loughborough University has calculated for us what the cost is of responding to child poverty. And it's £29 billion pounds a year. Um, and if poverty rises by another million, it's £35 billion pounds a year. Uh, and it's kind of stacked up with things like spending on services, tax <coughs> receipts lost to government, the spending on benefits and the loss in private earnings uh, to the individuals concerned. It's a huge amount of money. It's not cost effective to do this. Yes, we're all in together. Most amusing. 
Um, so on to what's going to happen to Social Security. So we're told, the other argument we get frequently is Social Security costs are spiralling out of control. So what does the OBR say about this? In their welfare report, what the OBR says is, over the past 30 years, welfare spending has risen steadily in cash and real terms, but on average that increase has been broadly in line with the growth in the economy. So the proportion of national income devoted to welfare spending has not shown a significant upward or downward trend over time. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> That's not the debate we're getting, is it? Um, this, uh, this is what it looks like, sort of uh, cash, cash increases, but the far side showing you what's actually happened as a proportion of GDP. And the flip up at the end was, was as a result of the uh, financial crisis in 2008, where you expect there to be additional spending because you get higher unemployment and the, the automatic stabilisers kick in. Um, so, interesting. <laughs> We're spending on out-of-work benefits has actually been falling. The line at the bottom shows... Um, Tax credits, that is the area where there has been increased spending in response to uh, poverty and work. Have we increased the value of benefits? No. The value of unemployment benefit job seekers allowance has reduced considerably over years. In the, 19, in ni the end of the 1970s, it was worth something like 22% of average earnings. It's now worth 11. So it's actually fallen in value significantly over, over the years. Ooh, is that in there? Okay. Um, <coughs> There's a slide disappeared there, which shows you what's been happening to sanctions. I don't know what's happened to it. It's fallen out. Um, <laughs> but anyway, massive increase in sanctions, as you all know. Um, and we do work on the front line in Tower Hamlets in food banks. And we know that many of the reasons for sanctions are extremely trivial. Five minutes late for an appointment, going to the doctors, going to a job interview, you name it. Um, people are getting sanctioned for. And as a result, we've seen this massive growth in uh, food banks uh, in across the whole of the UK. Um, but you know, just looking at one provider, which is Trussell Trust, which is the, the biggest, they've gone from providing 120,000 parcels to over a million. And we know that by far the majority of those people are there because of problems with benefits. Um, and we did a study with Trussell and the Church of England and Oxfam. It's not moving there. I don't know what's happening. Eh? Okay. <laughs> um, and these were the reasons people were there. Top reason, sanctions, waiting for benefits or ESA stop, accounted for more than half of people. Then you get up to 63% when you add in bedroom tax and benefit cap. And then benefit changes or delays takes it up to 78% of the reasons why people were at food banks. This is the first study that's been done. It's qualitative work. So it's giving us the range of reasons why the people were at the places we saw. There's a desperate need to actually do this on a proper quantitative basis. Um, but it's a pretty good indicator of why people are there. So future challenges on social security, universal credit, I think it's already been mentioned. Um, will it ever happen is question number one. Um, uh, you know, treasury, treasury gossip suggests that they might want to kill it or expect it will never happen. Um, we know that the take-on is incredibly slow, 175,000 people claiming it when in a couple of years' time there's supposed to be over 7 million. So what's going on? Why is it so, wh why is it so slow? And of course now torpedoed by these changes in the July budget, the cut to the family element, the cut to the work allowances, which means that for you know, a lone parent, for example, their loss, if they start out on universal credit or lose their transitional protection, is somewhere between £1,000 and £4,000 a year. Massive amount of money. For a couple, it's between £800 and £1,700 a year as a result of these cuts to universal credit. So I mean, we've been talking extensively to Conservative MPs who fondly believe universal credit is the answer to everything. You know, This is our flagship thing. But they haven't noticed that their own Chancellor has torpedoed it. And now tax credits look considerably better than what universal credit is going to deliver. It's a really threadbare version of what was first pr pr proposed. Um, when it was first proposed, the uh, government's um, uh, indicators suggested that it was going to lift about 300,000 children out of poverty. The last time they did an impact assess assessment, 
that was down to 100,000. And now they don't produce income, uh, <laughs> impact assessments anymore that say anything I intelligible. So we get no figures at all. So I think that tells you what you need to know. Uh, it's lost its poverty producing potential. Um, so I need to finish in a minute so Eileen can get going. But uh, in terms of social security, we're kind of lacking a vision. You know, IDS's vision of this enormous means test that would deal with everything, um, taking us away from social security towards a massive welfare system, and just responding to the poorest, which was, is his ambition. I was actually on a TV programme with him years ago. Um, when he was a backbench MP, where he said, what I'd like to do is to sweep away the whole welfare state and replace it with a single means test. Well, here we are. <laughs> um, so we've diminished the idea of social security. We've got, got ourselves lumbered with another enormous poverty trap. Um, you know, will they get rid of the last vestiges of the, of the national insurance system? There's a consultation out at the moment to abolish class two contributions for self-employed earners. What's going to be left? What independent entitlement will be left for women, for example, if that happens? Um, even august institutions like the Institute for Fiscal Studies argue that we should merge tax and national insurance together because it's, it's only a tax. Let's get rid of it. It's really worrying from my perspective because how do you get back to social insurance if anyone ever wants to do social insurance again once you've done something like that we're, we're forgetting the lessons about child benefit the way that it acts to prevent poverty um, and is protective and preventative and you can build <coughs> earnings on top of it as a platform rather than trapping you in means testing like universal credit will and it's not really about cost the government spent 12 billion pounds uh, a year raising the personal tax thresholds uh, which is, is put forward as a, as a kind of a poverty reducing measure. But of course, it's not 80% of it goes to the top half of the income distribution. It's middle and higher earners who've benefited from that. So there was plenty of money for that. And we didn't need the 12 billion, billion benefit cuts if we hadn't done that. Um, George Osborne's latest mantra, we want a higher wage, lower tax, lower welfare society. Um, I would add that to, to a higher poverty to that one. I think that's the one that's missing from the list, isn't it? Um, if, you, if, you then, if you immediately retrench uh, Social Security at the time when you're trying to raise wages, you're going to lead to enormous poverty. And in a way, it's interesting because Osborne's clearly not on message with Ian Duncan Smith's idea of the solution, the, the kind of the wage subsidy idea. He's trying to talk about moving away from that. So what is the ideological position of the government. Do they want what, what a lot of us supported years ago, actually, with the idea of higher wages, universal childcare, you know, lower housing costs, um, uh, you know, decent wages and don't trap people in a, in, a, in, a, in a poverty trap. But to do that needs all sorts of other things to happen, like universal childcare, like uh, restoring family benefits and child benefit. I mean, we've advocated a triple lock for children uh, in the uh, end child poverty campaign, uh, where where are they going? Because I mean, the MPs don't really understand this. They don't understand why the thing they've been arguing is the solution is now being attacked. Um, and there's more debate developing in the sector now again about what do we want to do: revive social insurance, try and advocate for a citizen's income where it's totally universal. But the problem is, it it doesn't do what tax credits did for lone parents, for example. Uh, what enabled loan parents to work part-time was that tax credits were considerably more generous than any of the proposals on this, so there are problems with it. Or progressive universalism, which was actually what delivered that reduction in child poverty, the only historical one we actually you know, got to data, data for, is that what we should be doing? It's all up for grabs. Um, and here's some, just some ideas. You could reward contribution again by adding in contributory elements to JSA. You could protect against new risks, for example, given that we're talking about families and work. Could you create a kind of new parental leave benefit so it's paid, rather than you just kind of drop out of earning altogether if you need a break from work? Um, more effective employment support for job seekers. Would it work better at local level? There are lots of examples that suggest it might. Uh, and, uh, and finally, we just have to do something to ensure children are protected against poverty, because we're not doing it at the moment. I'm just ending on a slightly positive note. This is the public saying what is it, the, the most important issue facing Britain today, and the proportion saying it's poverty and inequality, is going up. 
So let's hope we get some support from them for some of the changes that we need. Thank you very much.